Okay. Very happy to have uh, our lessons as a part of the overarching And their three D mirror symmetry. Okay, I will improve my writing in the course of the of the talk. And so yeah, this is joint work with Richard Rimani. And so as the title suggests, we'll talk about uh, stable envelopes in the context of both varieties and explore the three D mirror symmetry. So I will also take advantage of, of Harold's introduction of Coulomb branches to make my introduction slightly shorter. So we are still working in the context of, of 3D n equal 4 supersymmetric gauge the, uh, quantum field theories. So, theories in this context give rise to two very interesting mathematical objects. So, the Higgs branches and the Coulomb branches. Branch, and these two branches are expected to, uh, when put together and combined, they are expected to display some kind of mirror symmetry behavior. So the enumerative approach to 3D mirror symmetry, so just looking at at some packages of objects that can be associated with the branches on both sides. And these objects include. Uh, so given a X branch X, they include the toro fixed point with respect to some torus acting by automorphisms. They include the so-called vertex functions and also the so-called stable, stable envelopes. So as I was suggesting before, objects like this can also be associated on the dual side, and the idea is that either side completely describes the other side by some kind of mirror symmetric behavior. So I will not now dig into the precise statement. So the, throughout the, the talk. The X trig would be the dual, the dual space. So, given a Higgs branch, this will be the Coulomb branch. So, as I was saying, I will not now dig into the precise statement. It will become clear hopefully throughout the talk. But right now, I would like to focus on a specific class of spaces X and X trig to look at. And th these spaces are called bow varieties. So from a combinatorial point of view, both varieties are associated with, with some very um, funny diagrams, the so-called brain diagrams. So brain diagram D is an object like this. So it consists of a sequence of two types of brains. So there are the so called NS five brains and the so called D three brains. Uh, sorry, D five brains, while those in the middle are like this one are the D three brains. So in words a brain diagram is just a collection of brains put together in an arbitrary order like this one. So D5 and NS5 are connected always by a horizontal D3 brain. And the idea is that if we enrich this picture by prescribing some multiplicities, so the diagram together with the multiplicities gives rise to a Holomorphic, holomorphic simplectic variety that I will denote like this. So this will be a bow variety. And as I, was, uh, as I said before, it comes with a, a holomorphic simplectic uh, 
structure with a, to a, a torus acting on X by simple ectomorphisms. And also additional action, action of C star H bar, where H bar is just the weight of the symplectic form omega. In addition, these bow varieties, which I said as are holomorphic symplectic, come with a proper, actually, a, a projective morphism to what I will call an affine bow variety, uh, uh, so definition. So this is an affine variety. And this is proper. So in good cases, this will be not only proper, but it will be a, a symplectic resolution. And so, so this is totally similar to what happens with Nakajian variety. So you, in general, the affinization map is proper, and it becomes a symplectic resolution if it's also surjective, which is not always true. So yeah, the variety above the variety above is always smooth symplectic, whenever non empty, and uh, and it always comes to a, to an affinization map to an affine variety. Is instead will be in general singular. No, no, on, on, on either boundaries, there can, there can be either D5 and NSI brains. This is a good point, thank you. So I'm, here I'm just providing an example, but you can play with such diagrams and put whatever five brain at the end, whatever you like. So the upshot of looking at these kind of uh, funny pictures is that there is a very uh, combinatorial approach to produce the associated dual variety. So at the combinatorial level, we define the dual diagram as the diagram obtained by, so is obtained by replacing so D5 brains with NS5 brains and vice versa. So for example, so the, in the example above, the dual diagram will be given by so as you see here for instance the boundaries are brains of the opposite type is it my turn yeah okay and so we define the dual variety to be simply the variety whose diagram is dual and the dimensions are kept the same. So in particular, this will be the dual of my variety X where X is simply the short notation for this space here. Yeah, the I are always uh, positive. Actually, actually, maybe I, I should say so. They are strictly posit positive. Otherwise, like the diagram splits, and you get union, a uh, disjoint union of varieties. So and. Uh, So before now digging a bit in, deeper into the definition of brain diagrams uh, and the associated varieties, I would like to uh, give you examples to get some feeling about what kind of varieties we can produce with this machinery. And as an example, we can, we can produce all type A equivalent varieties. So type A equivalent varieties are uh, again, holomorphic symplectic varieties that are associated with, with uh, 
quiver, framed quivers like this one. So this is V1, V2, Vn, W1, W2, Wn. And the way to define a brain diagram, the, the corresponding brain diagram is the following one. So you should think of the of these pieces of the pieces of the quiver diagram as corresponding to this section of the bow diagram. And the number of D5 brains in between will be exactly equal to W1. And the multiplicities here are all equal and are equal to V1. And so, so V1 everywhere. So as, as a result, the corresponding diagram will be something like this. And instead, so there's a proposition that says the uh, given a quiver variety associated with a type, so a type A quiver, a type A AN quiver variety, then there are isomorphisms. So here on the top row, we have the holomorphic simplectic variety, so the resolutions. And here on the bottom, we have the affine varieties, the affine Nakajian varieties and the affine Bo varieties. And we have canonical isomorphism make, making this diagram commute. And so in particular, you see that any uh, type of queer variety can be described as a Bo variety. So of course here, uh, to be precise in the proposition, I should say that these diagram D and this dimension vector uh, small d are exactly those that come out of this procedure. But I will just say this in bold. However, it should also be stressed that not all bow varieties are of this form. And indeed, we have the following. Maybe I can write it here, the following proposition, which is due to Nakajima and Takayama, that states that uh, given a Higgs branch which we identify with a queer variety, so a Higgs branch of a type A queer gauge theory. Then the diagram so then the, the bow variety is the uh, Breverman, Finkel, Bernakajima, uh, Coulomb range. So in practice, if you are given a, a Higgs branch or, a, a, so, or more, more generally a type of queer gauge theory, its Higgs branch will be an Akajima variety. And if you want to produce the Coulomb branch, you can describe your queer variety in terms of the associated brain diagram. Then you uh, produce a dual diagram. And by taking the associated bow variety, you get the, the Coulomb branch. Maybe I should stress that this is since the Brevan Finkelder Nakajima construction defines the affine branch, I should pick the, the affine bow variety as well. But the uh, a byproduct of the bow variety approach is that we 
uh, not only get the, the fine column branch, but also a resolution. And so we can play a lot uh, by looking at, uh, uh, by, by working with the uh, geometric representation, so in the context of geometric representation theory with this object. And indeed, part, part of this talk, the main part of this talk will be about the geometric representation theory, then that can be studied on both varieties. So now I will spend just five minutes to describe, to, to, to explain how these varieties are actually defined. And the idea is not that very different from those underlying the construction of quiver varieties. So the idea is that given a brain diagram, we associate it, we, uh, we, we associate with a quiver. We study its representations of this quiver with dimension vectors that are produced by the dimension vector of the bow diagram. And we do some kind of simplicity reduction. More precisely, the idea is that we associate uh, some, for every uh, five brain, some uh, small quiver. So in the NS5 case, we simply, oh, sorry, consider this quiver. or well, direct the representations maybe. And in the uh, D5 case instead, we consider another type of quiver. Uh, so what's usually called a uh, three-way part because of this triangle, this shape of triangle. And the idea is that given a brain diagram, like the one above, we concatenate all these pieces according to the diagram itself and produce a, a big, a, a big uh, uh, diagram of representation of the quiver. So, so the procedure, So given the, the diagram and the dimension vector, we associate it with a quiver, uh, or more precisely some representations of the quiver. So as prescribed by the diagram, And then we consider a sub, uh, a, a sub variety Z inside the space of all quiver representations. Actually, Z should be the um, zero locus of the ideal defined by the relations uh, as follows. So let's give names to these maps. So we look at the zero locus of the relations for all the three-way parts. We get a sub-variety, and then we take the uh, uh, the, the symplectic, the GIT symplectic reduction with respect to the group G. GLDI. So here, this notation, this fancy notation, which also depends on some choice of character of G, means that we, we have some moment map 
from z of i to the real algebra of g and maybe represent it with dual and so the both variety x dd is given by mu minus one zero and then the actual GAT quotient with respect to G. So this is the definition, but as you already see from the definition, we are not ga gauging out the ver downstairs vertices. And this implies that there's a residual, there is a residual action. of a torus with rank given by the number of D5 brains, number of three-way parts that I have in my quiver associated to the brain diagram. So, and throughout the talk, I will call this torus, the torus A. And I should, I also remark that it's not completely trivial that uh, I get a sympathetic variety. It's not even, sorry, before I said we take the sympathetic reduction, it's not even trivial that this is uh, symplectic, but it is, and it's uh, a slightly delicate uh, uh, check to do. The point is that this space itself is not symplectic, it's Poisson, so one takes a symplectic slice given by these equations, and then takes the actual symplectic reaction. Hmm? Right, I mean, there's a, one can, there's a uh, prescribed stability condition that these three-way parts that has to be defined, but I won't dig into the details now. The whole, So before entering the realm of stable envelopes and in the core of the talk, I want to stress a few facts that will be useful later. So the first fact is that um, the fixed locus is finite, where now T is A times sister H. Secondly, that there is some, there's some hidden symmetry in these brain diagrams. And as a consequence, varieties with different brain diagrams can be secret, secretly isomorphic. And this uh, symmetry is encoded by the so-called hanani uh, uh, transition. Which consists in the following kind of surgeries of local surgeries of the brain diagram. So whenever I have two brain diagrams that differ like this, and whose multiplicities satisfy the following condition, then it follows that the, the varieties, uh, so let's say with D, that looks locally as follows and D prime are isomorphic. And the third fact, which will be uh, quite important for us, is that there is a very um, easy combinatorial code to um, describe uh, fixed point with respect to this action. And so I think this is one of those cases when a picture is way better than a thousand words. So let's consider a bow variety like this. Maybe something like this, okay. So first let me draw some fancy uh, lines and then we'll explain. Maybe, okay, that's fine. So, hmm? what is the, 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 the two? Ah, 
thank you. Yeah, so, so this is what is called a so-called tie diagram. And the rule is that whenever we are given a, a brain diagram with its multiplicities, we can describe some, we can produce some ties connecting different types of brains, so NS5 brains and D5 brains. And the prescription to produce these diagrams is that the number of ties of these, uh, these lines uh, that lay above each D3 brain should be equal in number to the multiplicity of the D3 brain, the D3 brain itself. So for instance, you see that here I have exactly two ties, although they are not very visible, but there are two, one and two. And according, uh, accordingly, the multiplicity here is two. And so the same is here, here, and here. And in principle, given a, a, a diagram, there are many ways of producing a ties. Hopefully I didn't produce a diagram with only one tie. It might be the case, but anyway, so, the, the story is that the tie diagrams are, yeah, one second, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with fixed, with torus expand. So the rule is the following. So start with, with some diagram, maybe let's consider, give an example. Let's consider this diagram here, very easy diagram. This is a secret that this is cotangent bundle of P1. So the idea is that you want to draw ties, so lines co connecting different type of brains. Eh? And the only rule you have to follow is that the number of ties either above or below any horizontal line of a different brain is equal in number to the multiplicity. So for instance, here I'm drawing a line and accordingly you have just one here. So you see that for instance, this, this produces uh, this is a illicit tie diagram. They, they can be either above or below, they count the same. So for the, they have, have one line here, one line here, one line here. Yeah, exactly. This, is, for this let's say that this is uh, one pole of the Riemann sphere P1, and the other possible tie is this one. You see, here I'm starting from disordered five brain. No, no, I can't count the last one. So like the, the multiplicity of a tie, if you like, is one. So here there are two ties above this brain and accord, accordingly this, this, this uh, multiplicity is two. So we are now fi uh, finally in the position to, to discuss stable envelopes and uh, the main results of the 3 d mirror symmetry. And so let's, let's study stable envelopes first. I know this is a very special audience, so usually I have to explain what a stable envelope is. Now we'll do it in a very fast way. Uh, so, in general, given a holomorphic symplectic variety satisfying enough properties like the bow varieties, uh, we can define some uh, classes either in cohomology, K theory, or elliptic cohomology. So in this talk, we'll be particularly interested in the elliptic stable envelope, so the elliptic version of these classes. And these are very rigid uh, characteristic classes encoding uh, the equivariant geometry of the Bo variety. So the idea is that given our Bo variety X, uh, We, can, we consider the A action, so the action of bisymplectomorphism, of the, the uh, torus acting bisymplectomorphisms. And 
we fix some chamber in the real the algebra of A. So a chamber means that in other words we fix a, a co-character, a generic co-character. And so given this co-character we can consider flow lines with respect to the sister action induced by it. So in other words, given our variety X, eh, which is simply <laughs> this thing, so we can consider the fixed points eh, inside of the variety, and we can consider all possible trajectories that flow to my to some prescribed fixed point f f is a fixed point in the variety and the idea is that to produce some classes that encode all the geometry of these flow lines and these are in brief the elliptic stable envelopes so more precisely the stable envelopes uh, which depend as i said before on some choice of chamber are some uh, elliptic uh, homology classes uh, supported on the so-called uh, full attracting set which is exactly the attracting set I will say it in words and the attracting set is exactly the collection of those these flow lines that land in some to the collection of the fixed point inside of x and they are uh, uniquely determined by uh, by the support condition plus some normalization condition which in word means that tell, tells us how they look locally around a specific fixed point so even more precisely to talk about <coughs> elliptic homology classes one should first study elliptic, the, the elliptic homology of the underlying variety and so for me elliptic homology will be some the elliptic homology to consider will be the elliptic homology of the um, simply of the fiber product of the variety fx if, if it starts with the affix locus so this is a scheme so with respect to the uh, thinking of the uh, so with, with respect to the usual way we think of homology this is its its spectrum so the, the standard cohomology analog of this space is simply the spectrum of the cohomology ring. Whenever this is uh, even, is when this is a whenever this is a commutative ring. Uh, so in particular, what we do with in our article with Richard, we define some line bundle depending on the, on, on the choice of a chamber and this line bundle satisfies uh, uh, some nice properties so this is uh, this is uh, an attractive line bundle in uh, using the language of Okunkov in his article in inductive construction of stable envelopes um, and by definition, but essentially by definition, the stable envelopes are are classes, or in other words, are a global section of this line bundle, which are meromorphic 
in the killer parameter Z. So I say killer parameter, something that I haven't introduced yet. And the reason is that actually, unlike for commodity key theory, elliptic stable envelopes depend on some extra parameters. And these are parameters are parameters in the so-called killer torus. So more precisely, they are Uh, we consider the elliptic homology of this fiber product uh, with again fiber product with the elliptic homology of the point with respect to another torus action or tri so of course a trivial action and so this is a very abstract uh, definition but uh, you should also keep in mind that there's also a very concrete way of thinking about this uh, the parameters entering the game and the idea is that, so as we see, as, as we have seen, the torus action, the action of A, uh, it comes from the D five brains. So you should think of the some of the uh, about some equivariant parameters huh, that are attached to the D five brains, and instead the killer parameters, so the parameters, the, um, the equivariant parameters associated to the, the killer torus are attached to the other type of brains, so to the NS5 brains. So in this case, there are three killer parameters. Uh, what is the subset of gamma of L for the Gamma of... Uh, uh, so I'm just saying that this will be meromorphic in these parameters. So actually, they are defined on some. So this line bundle will be a general line bundle. Or, or, um, so actually, so this will be a, a meromorphic section of the restriction of this line bundle, some open set uh, of this uh, second piece of the fiber product. Okay. Maybe this is a. Maybe this will be the key to to finish the talk in time. <laughs> so anyway, there's a general fact that again comes from the. The, the, the definition of concurrent definition of stable envelopes in this general context uh, that once uh, this attractive line bundle is defined, is, so it's fixed, uh, then the stable envelopes uh, are unique. So, unique in the sense that they, they exist and are uniquely uh, determined by this condition that I mentioned before. So this is the rigidity I was talking about before. And finally, I'm in the condition of uh, stating the main result that I would like to share with you today. But before, yeah. Please. Uh, so the choice, there, there are two choices. There's the, the choice of this chamber. So like of, this, of some cone in the real algebra of A, and there's also the choice of line bundle. Actually, this, one can see that this choice of line bundle is not very deep, and it's not a very deep choice in the sense that a stable envelopes defined for different choices of line bundles differ simply by some shift of this scalar parameter Z. And what is the, the, the striking, the very important choice that instead one has to make is the choice of a chamber. And as we will see, the different choice of chamber will lead to, lead to will, so the freedom of choice of chamber is a super, super important aspect of the theory because uh, these, less, some wall crossing uh, uh, from one chamber to another will give rise to R matrices and to solution of the, so to solution of the yen equation. But before saying that, I would like to, uh, make a remark. So 
as I said before, stable envelopes are pretty abstract, at least in principle, but uh, uh, fixing, so uh, a stable envelope stab C is the same of fixing a bunch of uh, classes subs tf depending on the finite fixed point finitely many fixed points in the the um, fixed locus so this fixed locus as we said is finite so this elliptic cohomology will be simply the union of elliptic cohomology of uh, a, a number of uh, both varieties x labeled by some choice of fixed point here and so stable envelopes are just a collection of such of classes labeled by fixed points. And with that in mind, the uh, main theorem that they would like to advertise today is that stable envelopes uh, um, satisfy uh, I cannot say the main theorem, so stable envelopes uh, enjoy uh, 3D mirror symmetry in the following sense. That's so given two dual blue varieties in, in the sense described above, then the stable envelope of the both variety X at a fixed point F will be equal, restricted to some fixed point G will be equal to the, the stable envelope of the dual bow variety of G restricted to F. So I will now explain the statement in a second, but to make it precise, actually I should normalize things a bit. So I should also divide by stable envelope Yeah, stable envelope. So the, the idea is the following. So take a pair of dual bow varieties. Consider the stable envelopes at two, two dual side, and then restrict the stable envelopes as, as prescribed by the formula. So restriction means that I'm given a cohomology class, and they're restricted to a fixed point simply by pullbacking cohomology. And to make the statement even more precise, I should explain to say that the equivariant and K parameters are inverted in the sense that in principle, there will be different K parameters on the dual side. And different, and different equivalent parameters and they are identified in the following way. And also another important remark is that, as the statement suggests, there is a way of associating fixed points of the dual, between dual varieties. And at the combinatorial level of tie diagram, this is, it's very clear how to do this. So for instance, let's consider this situation. So this will define some fixed point in the fixed locus of a bow variety. Then it's dual. The, the dual diagram is obtained simply by uh, taking the literally the mirror of this diagram with respect to the x-axis of the page. And the dual fixed point will be obtained simply by reflecting the ties with respect to the x-axis. So it's something like Oh, sorry, this one is wrong. Okay, now it makes sense. Okay. Okay. 
Right, so in words you could think of this as equality of elements in some localized uh, cohomology, in the sense that so the, the stable envelope, envelopes you can you should you should think of them as some classes in cohomology. So you restrict to some fixed point, you get a classes in the cohomology of the fixed point. This will be a rational function, uh, or actually in this context, an elliptic functions function in these parameters a and z. Of a point, yeah. So this stable envelopes are some theta bunch of theta functions uh, multiplied and summed together in a fancy way. And so here, this is simply a rational function. Uh, sorry, uh, well, I mean it's uh, ratio some ra ratio ratio of theta functions, yeah. Uh, in so like ratio of sums of theta functions. Really, it's like an equality of functions, right? Well, the yeah. Of right. Yeah. Uh, over is uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, right. But the story is that so both sides will be some functions on the elliptic cohomology of the point. So in general, this, so yeah, after the restriction, the stable envelope of F, F, F at the fixed point F. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the stable envelope at some point F, Will be some something on the. You should think of a function on uh, the elliptic homology of X because we have fixed some kind of fixed point instead of here. Okay, so now we pick we pick another fixed point in G in X and A, and then there's going to be accordingly a map to the elliptic from the elliptic homology of the of the singleton G, and we have a function and we pull it back. With respect to this map. So a and Z are, um, are both tori, and these parameters A and Z are the equivalent parameters of this tori. So I'm hiding some sister H bar. There are sister H bar everywhere on both sides. I'm simply hiding it to 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 to, to like to to ease the notation a bit, little bit. So, but there yeah, you can think of it so, so given any torus t, the elliptic homology of the point, you, you should, so given, a, this depends on, on the choice of an elliptic curve, this is E times Z, uh, uh, the, the character. It's a billion variety. It's a billion. Yeah. So this is it's a product of elliptic curves. So this is this is an equality of graph pair work functions on the billion variety. Yeah. 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 And it ends up being exactly what you said. So. The whole uh, 
work we did with Richard it was not about stating this uh, and like thinking and, and like coming up with this uh, conjecture, but which is due to Nina and other people, but uh, it was a, it was about proving it. And so, in, in the remaining part of this talk, I will ex hopefully explain the main ideas behind the proof. So, and uh, but before uh, doing this, maybe it's useful to explain in which cases this statement has been already proved, in which cases it is known. And there are not many statements, so there are not, not many cases. So there, there, there's the case of hypertoric. Uh, varieties but um, both varieties are, are, are almost never hypertrophic varieties then there's the case of the where x is the cotangent bundle of the full flag variety and finally there's the case where x is the cotangent bundle of the grassmannian KN with this condition on the dimensions. So in these cases, this, this mirror, mirror symmetry of stable envelope was already proved. And actually the uh, idea underlying our proof of the statement for the whole class of both varieties is to reduce ourselves to one of the only, you know, one of the few uh, cases where is already known. So the case of the full flag variety. So we would say some, some kind of geometrize a induction argument whose base is the mirror symmetry of stable envelope for the full flag varieties. And so the whole uh, machinery that we have to develop is a machinery that allows to uh, run the induction. So I will hopefully now explain how to do this. So, and this induction relies on two kind of statements. The so-called the so-called D5 resolution. And the NS5 resolutions. This is this is the, 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 the dual variety, the dual bow variety, the one that we obtain, obtain, obtain by <laughs> so let's start with the first one. So, what is a D5 resolution? The main idea behind it, consider D, uh, D5 resolution, is the it's considering this local surgery of the brain diagram. So, replacing a single D5 brain with a pair of two D5 brains. And the idea is that, so whenever I have a D5 brain, I have two multiplicities here. I can consider it their difference. Let's call it C. So C for me is D plus minus D minus. And the idea is that I can try to consider a finer diagram where I replace where I distribute these, um, uh, this number C, this is called a charge, into charges satisfying C1 plus C2 is equal to C. So this will be D minus plus C2. Yeah, everything is always positive. Hmm? Come again? So, so C plus has uh, yeah, yeah, good point. So let, let's say that we restrict ourselves. So by Hanani with an isomorphism, so what we have considered, I discussed before, we can always restrict ourselves to this case. So consider separated both varieties. So in this case, uh, uh, it turns out that D plus is always larger than D minus. So all the dimensions here are, are weakly increasing. 
and the idea is that so for a variety whose diagram looks like this and for a variety whose diagram look like this so they only differ by this modi local modification we can cook up, cook up an embedding and this embedding always also descends to the affine bow variety and it turns out that this is Cartesian which is a totally non-trivial result And so the proposition, the first proposition is that J is a, a, a regular equivariant embedding and equivariant with respect to what? Equivariant with respect to the torus A acting on this variety here so i would uh, i suggested to to notice that since since uh, we saw that the torus action is somehow connected is somehow attached to the d5 brains here here there's a different torus and the number of parameters equivalent parameters here is uh, exactly the number of parameters here plus one and simply because we are replacing a single par equivalent parameter here by a pair of parameters a1 and a2 so what we do more precisely is that we construct an embedding of the torus a maybe to be precise it should be a times c star h and that sends the our parameter a to a h bar minus c2 a so in part, it means that essentially we are specializing our equivalent parameters a1 and a2 to let me write a h minus c2 and then a2 goes to simply a So let's give this guy a name. Let's call it phi. Sorry. So the story was that so to each D5 brain, so to each brain like this one, uh, there's a piece of uh, uh, di a diagram like this. So from the vert vertex downstairs, there's a there's a sister action. And the A is the equivalent variable attached to this, uh, so that uh, um, associated to this uh, one dimensional. Yeah, yeah. So the, the whole torus A is just a collection of all these stars. So you, you see that if I replace a single brain in the diagram with a pair of brains, I get one more variable. So if I want to produce an equivalent embedding, I have to also prescribe a map between the tori. And this is what the map does, the phi map does. And the proposition, and then what we get is the following proposition that the, the stable envelope of X, huh? At some point, f is equal up to some, up to some coefficient to the stable envelope of some point f tilde of the it's the, it's the larger varieties of the what we call a d5 resolution, where f tilde is a fixed point. So 
satisfy this condition. So in Word, what you are saying is that, so pick a fixed point here, inside of the original variety X, there will be a unique connected component in the fixed locus of X tilde with respect to the A action induced by this map. Then you can pick any uh, fixed point instead of F under the residual action of A tilde. And then there is an equality of the stable envelopes up to the identification of the parameters. Uh, sorry, C, A, Z, H bar. And then also I have to pull back by phi and I end by J. Now it makes sense. So F is a fixed component in X tilde with respect to the A action of A. So I'm, so in general on X tilde, there's an action of A tilde by definition. This map prescribes an action of uh, A on X tilde. So I consider the fixed component. I'm saying component because in general it will be positive dimensional, but there will be only one component uh, that contains the image of the fixed point F with respect to the map J because this map is equivalent. And so I can pick any fixed point with respect to a residual action in F and I get this statement. And of course, this, uh, I should stress that this coefficient depends on the choice of X. What? This one? Yeah, it's a, so this F is fixed by A, so there's a residual action of A tilde mod A, and I pick any, some fixed point inside of it. So this is half of, of our uh, argument. There's the other half, is about doing the same thing, but now re resolving NS5 brains. So let's say that R is the difference D minus minus D plus. So again, in this case of a separatable variety, this will be uh, a positive integer. So we can split it into into, and consider brain, a, a, a replacement, a local replacement of a brain in the brain diagram with a, a pair of brains. So this will be uh, D minus plus R1. So let's give a name, a name of the associatable variety. So let's say this is X and this is X bar. So notice that now we are simply working with the NS5 brains. We are not touching the D5 brains. So in particular, the same torus acts both here and here because tor the torus is attached to the D5 part of the diagram. So the D5 brains, we are not messing up with them. So the same torus acts on both these spaces. On the other hand, we are messing up with the Keller parameters because you remember that the Keller parameters, the Z parameters were attached to the NS5 brains. Uh, so this statement here. Yeah, no, I mean, so the way you're structuring the variant and the way it, I presume you do, because you do everything. I'm thinking about what happened in this case. So, so you're asking how we, we came up with the, the, this embedding here? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, the, the story, the, the, there are two things. So, first of all, we wanted to have a Cartesian diagram like this. So this already constrains a lot the, the embedding J. And so at the end of the day, we actually only needed to produce an embedding satisfying this property uh, and being equivalent. So I, I, if, I, if I said that there's only one embedding, I would be lying because I'm not sure. But we only came up with an embedding. We produce it. It, it satisfies this uh, Cartesian property. And that's what we need to deduce a statement like this. Because so, so I think you I think you should have that is clear to you or that's the, 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 the 
Ajá. We, we constructed it as well. So actually, the construction come from the, at the level of the representation of the quiver. So they descend both to the, to this uh, GIT quotient and the uh, categorical quotient downstairs. And maybe after the talk, I will explain uh, in a very simple case how to define this embedding to give you a bit more insight. But for the time being, let's just say that we only found one that, that works. And That's a good point. Not, the, the image of this uh, F is none of the, does not coincide with any of this F tilde. That may, 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 may explain why we can all use all of them for such a statement. Hmm? We, we can pick any fixed point. So uh, there are choices for which this coefficient is easier. But, uh, but yeah, we can, we can choose any. Yeah. I think that this is fine because now we are on, on, on this side and so the dimensions are increasing in this direction. Ah, yeah, no, you're right. Thanks. And the, the geometry corresponding to this. Sure, sure, sure. I'm here for this. How? The fixed points. Yeah. So the fixed points are related. Uh, uh, so pick one fixed point here. Consider its image in X tilde. It will lay in some component, capital F, under the action of A. And then I consider, I consider the residual action of A tilde on this component, and I pick any fixed point uh, under the residual, this residual action. There's a, a more geometric statement that relates the stable envelope here with the stable envelope here that does not rely on a choice of this component, but it's a bit more technical, so maybe I will discuss at the end of the talk. However, uh, what I can discuss now is the geometry that, it, that, that, it associate, uh, that we can associate to this kind of local uh, resolution of the NS5 brain. And the geometry is the one of a Lagrangian correspondence, so the proposition. Is that there exists a Lagrangian correspondence where this one is an inclusion and this is a proper and this is a Lagrangian. So this is Lagrangian in the product x times x bar. So it's like rendering here. And this, this diagram descends to an equality at the level of the stable envelopes, which is realized as a sort of a pull push formula. So uh, the dimension of this one is always larger than this one. How much? Uh, I can tell you. Uh, it's two. So the difference of the dimension is two the dimension of the Grassmannian R1, R1 plus R2 complex. So the dimension of this guy is, uh, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's R1 plus R2 
times R1, uh, times R1, 2 minus 2 R1, 2, I guess. And there's a, there are some simplifications, but I cannot. It's, two, it's 3 a.m. for me, so I will <laughs> oh, That's a positive number. Um, so what we deduce at the level of the stable envelope is that the stable envelope of A, so let's state it in this way, uh, for any fixed point in X, there exists a unique uh, fixed point F till uh, F sharp inside the, um, the fiber seen as something is in the living inside the resolution. Okay. Hmm? It's not this one. Is the dimension of uh, the cotangent bundle of a Grossmanian? The, co the dimension of the cotangent bundle of this Grossmanian, so these two. So maybe I would say the yeah, Higgs branch. And the statement relating the the stable envelope is the following one. Um, D, I. But with the change of variable, now we have to, to, to make the statement precise. We also have to introduce some change of variables and the change of variables is the one here. So now we have a Z variables here the Z prime and Z double prime. So now we say the Z double prime is in Z H bar to R1, and this is simply Z. So we have to, this stable angle here simply depends on Z. In principle, this would depend on Z prime and Z double prime, but we are specializing, so we said Z prime is equal to Z, and Z double prime is equal to Z H two R one. So this was the, were, were the killer parameters. So the, the parameters of the torus act, acting trivially on the bow variety. So uh, there's no geometry directly connected with them, but they enter in the definition of the stable envelopes because they enter in the definition of the line bundle. Uh, Whose stable, uh, of which the stable envelope is a, is a section. So we were defining the Lipschitz stable envelope as a section of a certain line bundle. This line bundle were, was depending on some extra parameters. These are the Z parameters. The reason why they depend, it depends on these extra parameters is like a bit mysterious, at least with respect to what I've discussed today. But there, there's, a, there's an explanation why these parameters enter and we have to do this specialization. Yeah, correct. And, so, and it's very important for the, so without Z parameters, there would be no good definition of stable envelopes. And so now everything is set up because uh, we have all the ingredients to prove the mirror symmetry in the sense that we know how, to, we are, if we are given any bow variety, so any brain diagram of this form up to Hanani with an isomorphism, so in principle, this variety comes with arbitrary uh, charges. So something like this. However, however, by the proposition I discussed above, we can replace any all the brains with a number of brains uh, 
all whose charges are one, and we can do the same for for the DeFi brains. And so, why does this help us? This helps us because this turns out to be the cotangent bundle of some large flag variety. Full flag variety. And now we'll just say it in words. We do this on the original side. We do this on the dual side for the, so for X. We do it both for X and X shriek. So we relate this stable envelope of the, both, both X and X shriek to the stable envelope, the cotangent model of the full flag variety. Mirror symmetry is known there. So essentially what's left is to compare the coefficients entering in these formulas. But, uh, for the uh, but it turns out that this is uh, an easy job. And essentially this concludes the, uh, the sketch of the proof I would I wanted to share with you. So in principle, uh, there are many directions where this work can be tried to be uh, extended. So one could try to look at the other um, ing key ingredient in the, uh, the dictionary about mirror symmetry that I introduced at the very beginning of the talk. So in the beginning of the talk, I talked about stable envelopes. I also talked about vertex functions, a certain enumerative counts. Uh, that in display some mirror symmetric behavior, or at least they are expected to do that. And so what we are trying to do now is to try to uh, use this, these tools that we have developed for stable envelopes to prove the 3D mirror symmetry conjecture for vertex functions. But this is another story, and I think it's already late enough to say this, that I'm done with the talk. Thanks. So, for a star full flag, I don't think we need a sum over trees, right? I mean, it should collapse, but it's a... Sum over trees, like... Yeah, exactly. We don't need that. Yeah. So... Then, how complicated is this, right? <laughs> is it 